Um, thank you to everyone for taking the time out of your day to attend our grants workshop. As a reminder, we will be recording this presentation to post on our website. And if you have any questions, we have a Q we will have a Q&A portion um, after the presentation. So please post your question in the chat box below. And we will first get started with the message from Congresswoman Strickland. This is U.S. Representative Marilyn Strickland from the 10th Congressional District of Washington State, and I want to thank you for your interest in federal grant funding opportunities. Our office has already helped secure hundreds of millions of dollars for local organizations doing fantastic work. And part of our responsibility in a, dist in a district office is to make sure that people understand that there is access to federal grants to help you be more competitive and to get vital resources. Our office is here to support you, to let you know about the grants that are available, to help you navigate the system, to help make sure that your grant application is as strong as possible, and to make sure that we're able to get your money back into the district. Federal grant funding opportunities represent a great way for local communities and local organizations to get access to much needed federal funding, whether it's for human services, social services, and a myriad of opportunities that we have to strengthen our district. So thank you very much for your interest in federal grant opportunities. Our office is here to support you, to help you have a more effective experience, and to make sure that we're able to bring as much funding as possible into the mighty 10th Congressional District of Washington State. Thank you for the work that you do, and we're so thrilled that you're here with us today. All right, thank you, Congressman, for that message. Um, for all of our attendees today, you all likely know that this is a joint uh, workshop with our partners from USDA Rural Development Office and uh, the EPA, so we are very excited. Um, and so now I'm going to turn the meeting over to Helen and Marty, who will present on some current and upcoming grant opportunities available through uh, USDA Rural Development. So I think Helen, you are up. Yes. Thank you so much for including us. I am going to share my screen here and get started. We are very um, grateful for the opportunity to be with you and share some information about USDA. I will warn you that at USDA uh, Rural Development, often we, sp we spell grants L-O-A-N-S, but other than that, <laughs> we have often combinations of grants and, and loans that are available. I think it's important to note um, the important role that Congress has played in, in investing in America and uh, Congresswoman Strickland's um, leadership there has made a big difference all across our country. There's a great website where you can see those investments and drill down to Washington state uh, or other states too. Uh, it's called invest.gov. And as you can see right here in Washington state, there's been significant investments in the mighty 10th district, uh, a lot of transportation investments of $500,000 that went to Nisqually tribe broadband expansion in rural development. We've supported just in the last year, five rural businesses with uh, Rural Energy for America program grants to do energy renewal and uh, efficiency investments. So those are dollars that are coming right back into the 10th district and making a, a real big difference in our local economy. Uh, rural development is kind of unique in the Department of Ag in that our focus is totally on rural uh, uh, communities and and we take that very seriously we we have really over 70 different programs uh, you're going to hear about our infrastructure programs today but we also support housing sub, uh, repair and housing purchases um, we help support rural businesses community facilities as I mentioned some renewable energy and also certainly our critical infrastructure on these links, and I know everyone will be receiving these slides later, there is a, a eligibility map that shows where our different programs are available and there are different um, eligibility requirements based on population. And so there are different parts of the 10th district that 
are able to apply for different programs within USDA rural development. For instance, our business programs are for areas of 50,000 or less in population. And then uh, some of our, our water programs are for 10,000 or less. So it, it does matter these, but the, the eligibility maps are really easy to use. And also the investments by congressional district uh, are helpful. This chart shows investments over time in the 10th district. Uh, and we're always looking for more opportunities to help support our rural areas. We are grateful for the partnership with Congresswoman um, Strickland. This was photo was taken at a recent visit to the farm at Franklin Pierce schools when we had our then undersecretary social tourist small visiting. Again, my name is Helen Price Johnson. I'm the state director for rural development and welcome uh, your contact anytime. And I'm gonna turn over the presentation to Marty Canasti from our uh, water programs. Let me share my screen. And I'm going to move some notes over because I want to make sure that I get everything in and give you all of the information that you need. So my name is Marty Canancy. I am the state specialist for Washington State USDA community programs. Uh, this first slide gives you just a brief overview that we're gonna take a look at. Um, so today I'll be sharing with you an overview of the Water and Environmental Program, more commonly referred to as WEP. Uh, WEP includes financing for water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste projects. Uh, also, depending upon eligibility, uh, we do have pre-planning grants um, available as well as search grants, which have a narrower eligibility and no match. Um, in the pre-planning grant, that's up to $60,000. Um, it does come 75%. So you do have a 25% match. Uh, the, those are used so that you can complete an environmental review or a preliminary engineering report, those documents needed to complete a full application with USDA. So WEP is one of two programs uh, provided by USDA community programs. The second program is community facilities program, more commonly known as CF. The WEP program provides funding to rural populations of less than 10,000. Eligible applicants are municipalities, counties, cities, um, special purpose districts, Indian tribes, nonprofits. The eligible use for funds are to connect or repair, modify, expand, uh, or make improvements to water systems, wastewater, stormwater, solid waste disposal facilities. Uh, eligible project costs um, do include acquisition of easements, rights of ways, water rights um, needed to support the proposed project. Uh, also included in the eligibility are uh, legal uh, expenses uh, associated with the project engineering and bond council costs. Uh, loan terms are up to 40 years. So we do not we do not go past 40 years in our loan terms, and they're based on need or the life of what is being funded. So the, that determination is needed um, and it's completed during underwriting. Grant funds are based on need, eligibility, and availability. Davis-Bacon Act does not apply to our funding, but state prevailing wage may apply depending upon your entity. So a public body would have a prevailing wage requirement while a nonprofit may not. USDA's fiscal year in September 30th, we're coming up on that quickly. And each year begins a new fiscal year on October 1. So the current interest rates that I've showed here um, 
are good until September 30th. And October 1st, we'll learn about our new rates and be able to share those. So the current rates are 2.125% for a poverty rate. Uh, with a potential, and I say potential because it's based on need and eligibility grant availability, um, up to 75% grant. On an intermediate rate, it's 2.875. The rate is still very good. And that potential is up to 45% grant, again, based on availability and eligibility. And then we have a market rate of 3.625. <clears throat> Excuse me. State funding um, has open application periods and they have cycles. So they have funding cycles. USDA accepts applications every day of the year. Um, the time to begin looking at your project and asking questions is the time that at the point in time that you've identified that you have a need. So start talking to um, USDA, your state funders. We can have informal tech teams um, to you know, give you a better view of funding for your project. And hopefully you, at the end of that tech team, you have an action plan. So what can a uh, rural development state or state rural development loan specialists do for you. Um, when you identify a project, like I said, reach out to your loan specialist. The early conversation can save you valuable time. Loan specialists can assist you uh, during the application uh, through underwriting. And then during construction, the loan specialist will work closely with you and your engineer and USDA uh, engineer to keep the construction moving. Uh, the loan specialist will work with you, your interim financer, if it's required. There is a requirement for an interim financer if your loan is more than five hundred thousand, and USDA will work with everyone as a team, and your bond counsel to make that process move as as smoothly and quickly as possible. After project completion, your loan specialist is going to follow up with you and work closely with you until your loan's paid off. Um, and, and they're, they're going to help you complete those servicing actions. What is a complete application? A complete application is, um, sorry, I, I wasn't sure I had the right slide there for you. So a complete application, um, uh, is completed through RD Apply, which is an online application portal. Um, some some items to keep in mind is that um, the, the application that you complete and already apply still has a few things that need to be uh, uploaded to it. Some of those things are a public meeting um, and the meeting notes announcing the pro project to the public and taking public comment. The preliminary engineering report or PER um, as we talk about it and the environmental uh, documents that meet the environmental requirements, you'll need to work with your loan specialist to identify the level of that documentation needed. So early conversation is very important. And lastly, uh, I wanted to introduce you basically to your loan specialists. Um, you don't have the faces, but you have their names and their numbers, phone numbers on this map. And there are six loan specialists strategically placed in Washington state and ready to serve you. There are three specialists located in the western portion of Washington state and three in the eastern section. Uh, you have a community program director, Connie Reynolds, myself, a state loan specialist, Betsy Dillon, our state engineer and Tammy Champagne, our state environmental coordinator. Leading our state is Helen Price Johnson, who just provided you her overview of USDA's funding availability. Um, we want to thank you for allowing us the time to share uh, an overview of the water and environmental program. And with this, I'll turn it back to the presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Marty and Helen.
for that presentation. I also want to remind attendees that if they have any questions related to USDA, what we what they just presented on, grants in general, um, how our office can support or um, EPA grants to put them in the Q&A chat, and then we will have a Q&A portion at the end. Um, and then I will also remind folks that we'll be sharing these presentations via email afterwards. Um, so we are now going to pivot and hand it over to um, our EPA partners. Um, Abby, Kat, and Derek will go through um, their presentation. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Abby. Thank you, Sienna, and good morning, everyone. Uh, EPA is thrilled to be here today to speak to our friends in District 10. Um, I want to introduce, there are a couple of people presenting on behalf of EPA. I'm Abby Hook. I'm a senior advisor for Regional Administrator Six Killer here in Region 10, which includes Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and 271 tribal nations. Um, I'm joined by Kat Compton, who is our climate lead for the region, and Derek Tarada, who's a senior advisor in our environmental justice program. So they'll go over some of the details. I just wanna open by saying it's a really exciting time um, to be at the EPA with the president and administrator's priorities. Um, we are doing work in a manner that we've never done it before and, and sort of uh, uh, often building as we're flying the plane, as they say. Um, the agency is going to be moving uh, $100 billion um, through just us in about the next, or the remainder in the next probably 14 months. Um, and so we're excited that people are here to learn more about how some of those resources might, might land in District 10. Um, the presentation that we have today is a little bit text heavy and it has a lot of live links. Again, um, Sienna and Philip and others will be sending this out. So we encourage you to use it as a resource. Um, so before going into some of the details around environmental justice and climate, uh, full disclosure, I am on loan to the EPA from a local government. And when I came into my position last December, one of the things that I was uh, you know, screaming from the rooftops tops is people, nobody has visibility to how the money is moving. You know, we have these enormous numbers. Um, so I wanted to start with a quick overview on the structure that EPA and I imagine other federal agencies are using. So um, first is direct funding. So that's when you actually apply to the EPA for a grant that goes directly to your organization. Um, this can be tribes, CBOs, nonprofits, uh, municipalities, just about anyone, but it is a, a narrower part of the funding that we're talking about. Um, the second is funding through existing partnerships. So this is uh, ways that EPA has always moved money. So you think of like the state revolving fund where EPA will give the Department of Ecology and Department of Health large sums of money for drinking water and then uh, water infrastructure like wastewater and stormwater. And those uh, are continuing to happen and often uh, we have bumped the numbers on those up uh, to, to uh, accommodate things like the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, and then finally, we have a new stream of funding, which we are colloquially calling Fund the Funder. It's not the best name, um, but this is where we give a few large grants to organizations. And again, that could be the state, it could be a nonprofit, it, um, who then does subawards on our behalf. And this is a new model that we are using largely uh, because of feedback that we've received from our, our grantees um, that Federal funds are hard to apply for, they are difficult to report on. And by doing a fund the funder uh, model, we can have those organizations that receive the really large amounts of money and then sub-award, they can take on some of that administrative burden, whether it be the application uh, or the reporting or the direct contact with uh, EPA itself. So just want to go over that from the get-go because I think there is some confusion about how we are moving both bipartisan infrastructure law funding and Inflation Reduction Act funding. So with that, I will turn it over to Kat to go over some of the basic principles around climate, and then we'll talk about environmental justice, the big picture. 
Great, thank you, Abby, and good morning, everyone. My name is Kat Compton, and I am the Climate Programs Lead for EPA Region 10. And I'm gonna focus mostly on our climate grant programs, which are being funded through the Inflation Reduction Act. So I just wanted to set the stage a little bit before you before we dive into individual grant programs really take a step back and acknowledge the truly historic nature of the Inflation Reduction Act and its impact that it's going to have on our climate work across the country and including here in Washington state. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, makes a, a truly historic investment in the climate action that we're taking across the country. And we expect that it will contribute to helping the US reduce our US emissions by 40% by 2030. And so that's a that's a big number and a, a pretty transformation transformational uh, achievement in a short period of time. And we're really excited at EPA to be a part of that. Uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act, EPA uh, is working on distributing about forty billion dollars in funding. And that forty billion, it's largely accounted for in these six programs that you see on your screen right now. I'm going to provide a little bit of an update on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants. Today, you'll hear a little bit about the Environmental and Climate Justice Block Grants from uh, Derek, and that has a new name, so, so be aware of that. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of other funding uh, to tackle lots of different parts of the climate story, and so just be aware that we're going to cover a small portion of that today, but uh, there's more there's more out there and you're and you're more than welcome to reach out to me with questions and I can put you in touch. Next slide, please. Let's see. I'm not seeing the slide advance, Abby. If you can. Hmm. Ah, there it goes. Okay. So we might have a little bit of a delay on our end. So apologies for that. Um, this is another background slide. If you're anything like me, looking at line items in a big piece of legislation or, or a funding table may not work so well for your brain. And so it can be really helpful to think about all of this climate funding through different themes or different sectors. And so this is just a, a quick picture to demonstrate that EPA really has a lot of different grant programs that are funding our climate work through different mechanisms like Abby mentioned. Um, grants to different organizations, and then sector by sector, we're really thinking about grant programs that are going to help us decarbonize and reduce our emissions. And so if there's a sector that you're especially interested in, um, there's, there's likely a grant program out there, if not from EPA, from another, uh, another federal agency that can help support your goals. Okay, and then I'll turn it over to Derek to talk about environmental justice. Hi, my name is Derek Tarada. I'm the Senior Environmental Justice Advisor here at EPA Region 10. I'm just going to jump in to talk about EPA's definition of climate or environmental justice. So environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And so we believe this goal will be uh, achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision making processes to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn and work. Um, I'll jump in later to talk a little bit more about some of our environmental justice programs and funding, but I'm going to turn it back to Kat to talk some of, about some of the uh, climate or the uh, climate justice work that she is doing. Great, thank you. So I will acknowledge that these are very text heavy slides. They're meant to be a resource deck for you. We'll make sure that you have a copy of them after the presentation. And there are lots of embedded links in here. So I encourage you to, to click around and learn more on our websites. So think about this as a reference for you. Um, like I said, I'm gonna to touch on the GGRF and CPRG programs. And so the first, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, this is the largest program funded through EPA through the Inflation Reduction Act. This is a $27 billion program that currently has three grant competitions uh, out now and applications for all three are due October 12th, 2023. And you can think of these as uh, what Abby described as the fund the funder model. So these are going to be large grants uh, to support 
different financing mechanisms for a broad host of climate and environmental work. And so on the right hand side in the box, you can see the, for example, the Clean Communities Investment Accelerator has quite a quite a large uh, range of potential projects that could be funded under that program. You can also explore the who submitted a notice of interest to apply for the Solar for All competition. This is a $7 billion grant program to fund, uh, fund the funder models across the country to support residential rooftop solar, community solar, and associated storage and upgrades. Um, and this is something that you're not gonna see funds uh, into the communities for a little bit of time yet. We need to work our way through reviewing applications and making awards to these big funders. And then they will work to stand up and develop these funding financing structures, either grants or low cost loans to help support projects in the community. So this is a really, this is one to watch. I want you to watch it really closely and make sure that you're following along for who in, in Region 10 and who in Washington State is being funded through this program so that when they are ready to put a, a grant program or offer a, a low interest loan to community projects that you're ready with a project already thought of uh, to take full advantage of this program. So definitely watch this one. Next slide, please. And then I also wanna highlight the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Program. This is a $5 billion grant program. Uh, we're currently uh, in the first phase of this program, which is a $250 million fund nationally for climate planning. Uh, states had the opportunity to raise their hand for a $3 million planning grant. Municipal statistical areas, which is a census designation for a large metropolitan area, had the opportunity to raise their hand for a $1 million planning grants. And there are grants to tribes and intertribal consortia all across our region to do this climate planning process. And so I've listed here for Washington State, the Washington State Department of Commerce is leading the Washington statewide planning process. And the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency is leading a regional planning process on behalf of the greater Seattle area, the uh, MSA, including Tacoma and Washington's 10th. So this is something definitely to watch. This is important, this planning process are, processes are important because this phase one planning leads into phase two, which is going to be a competitive grant program to fund implementation projects associated with the plans that are being developed now. We anticipate that the, fund, uh, the funding notice for that implementation grant program will be announced in September of 2023. So here we are at September 14th. Uh, so there's a couple more weeks left in the month. We expect uh, shortly that we will see a notice of funding opportunity published for those implementation grants. And the key part about this grant program is that the implementation grants are going to be tied to this phase one planning process. And so organizations that are eligible, including state governments, uh, local governments, tribes, intertribal consortia, and pollution control agencies will be able to apply directly to EPA for implementation grant funds to implement items in a plan that were created under phase one. So if you are a local government um, or a tribal government and you're interested in implementation funding, I would suggest that you make sure that you are connected to these two planning processes in our state to make sure that your priorities are included in that, in that initial planning process, which will then give you access to implementation funds. You are more than welcome to reach out to me and I can help connect you to the right people, uh, but definitely wanna make sure that everyone is aware of that, uh, that nuance of the, connect, the connection between the phase one and phase two planning. Okay, that's all for me and I'll turn it back to Derek. Hi Kat, thanks. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the uh, funding that's coming from our environmental justice office. Uh, like Kat and Abby both reiterated, these slides are incredibly text heavy. Um, there was a little bit, I, I had to actually cut some text out of it. it was, it's kind of amazing, but um, make sure that you click on the links that are embedded throughout the slides to get more information about the details, the specific details of each grant program. Uh, so I want to start off quickly by talking about a few grant programs that we are currently in the process of reviewing and awarding. 
The first is the Environmental Justice Collaborative Problem Solving Grant. Uh, this program is designed for projects that support community-based nonprofit organizations in their collaboration with other partners to develop solutions that will significantly address environmental or climate or environmental or public health issues in communities disproportionately impacted or burdened by environmental harms. We call this the EJCPS program, and it anticipates awarding approximately $30 million of Inflation Reduction Act funding through 83 cooperative agreements across the nation. Another program that I wanna to touch upon is the Environmental Justice Government to Government Grant Program. Uh, it is for partnerships of community-based organizations and government entities such as states, local governments, federally recognized tribes and US territories. The purpose of this program is to create and or uh, create model or and or model government activities that lead to measurable environmental or public health results in communities disproportionately burdened by environmental harms and risks. The EJ G to G program, as we call it, anticipates awarding approximately $70 million through 70 cooperative agreements nationwide. The request for applications for both of these programs closed in April, and we hope to announce the recipients of the grants in the near future. Another grant program that I want to talk about, uh, which is along the fund the funder model that Abby alluded to at the beginning of the presentation, is our EJ Thriving Communities Grant Makers Program. So grant makers will design and manage the new EJ Thriving Communities subgrants program in collaboration with the EPA as a pass-through competitive sub-award program. So it's a fancy way of saying fund the funder. It is for up to 11 three-year cooperative agreements funded at 50 million per. So it'd be 11 cooperative agreements throughout the country of which that are 50 million uh, to each cooperative agreement of which of that 50 million, 80 million or 80% 80 of that money will be passed through. Uh, so the goal of this program is to reduce the burden from federal from applying to federal grant applications and to increase the efficiency of getting federal funds into the hands of local communities. So this one uh, is another grant to keep an eye on as we'll be funding larger entities to fund smaller entities. And so the larger entities will be designing the competition program. And so keep an eye on this one because there be going to be there's going to be further competitions of smaller grants coming from this one in the future. Uh, next slide. Next, I want to talk about uh, a grant opportunity that will be uh, announced pretty soon. It's EPA's uh, climate and or environmental and climate justice community change grants program. So we call them the community change grants. Kat alluded to this earlier in the presentation. So this program will invest approximately $2 billion in Inflation Reduction Act funds in environmental and climate justice activities to benefit disadvantaged communities. These place-based investments will be focused on community-driven investments or community-driven initiatives to be responsive to community and stakeholder input. They are designed to deliver on the transformative potential of the IRA for communities most adversely and disproportionately impacted by climate change, legacy, for legacy pollution, and historical disinvestments. EPA's Office of Environmental Justice and, Civil, and External Civil Rights plans to issue the Community Change Grants Notice of Funding Opportunity, or as we call them NOFOs, which you might hear uh, throughout uh, some EPA funding presentations later in 2023. So the Community Change Grants will fund projects that reduce pollution, increase community climate resilience, and build community capacity to respond to environmental and climate justice challenges. The activities to, perform, to be performed under the grants are expected to fall under the following categories, uh, climate resiliency and adapt, adaptation, mitigating climate and health risks from urban heat islands, extreme heat, wood heater emissions and wildfire events, community led and other pollution monitoring pre prevention and remediation, investments in low and zero emission and resilient technologies and related infrastructure, workforce development that supports the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants, reducing indoor toxics and indoor pollution, 
in facilitating the engagement of disadvantaged communities in state and federal advisory groups, workshops, rulemakings, and other public processes. I've linked the website for this grant opportunity at the title of this slide, but for more information, you can contact ccgp at epa.gov and EPA will also share updates through the Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights list, listserv. And to, dis, and to subscribe to that listserv, you could send a blank email to join-epaej at list.epa.gov. And both those links are on the slide. Next slide, please. So finally, I wanna talk about our Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. Um, if you listen to more EPA presentations, we call them Tic Tacs. Uh, they were awarded in early June. The, the Tic Tac program is a partnership with the Department of Energy, and it is part of the Federal Interagency Thriving Communities Network. So fe many federal agencies have a Thriving Communities themed programs, and it is part of the Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 program to ensure that 40% of the benefits of certain federal pro programs flow to underserved and overburdened communities. So EPA's Thriving Communities themed programs are the Tic Tac, as well as the Grant Makers program that I mentioned earlier. The Tic Tac program is a $177 million five-year program to stand up technical assistance centers to provide training and capacity building support for tribes, community organizations, interested parties, and community partners with environmental justice concerns. Region 10 is fortunate to have two Tic Tacs, one based out of the University of Washington and the other the Willamette Partnership, which is based out of Portland, Oregon. So what exactly do the Tic Tacs do? So a way that I think about them are uh, tutoring centers for EJ and environmental justice related funding opportunities with the ultimate goal of these centers is to provide uh, increasing increased access to federal and other funding opportunities related to EJ and energy justice. So the Tic Tacs are intended to build community capacity from the ground up, which is something that community leaders have asked the EPA for for years. Uh, we, the Tic Tacs will provide grant writing assistance to strengthen applications for environmental and energy justice related funding, assist organizations in managing federal grants, help organizations identify funding sources to apply for. And this includes federal, state, local, and even private philanthropic grants. Uh, they will help navigate government systems such as SAM.gov and Grants.gov. They will help develop partnerships and coalitions addressing energy and environmental justice issue. And they hope to assist in community engagement, meeting facilitation, and translation and interpretation services for non-English or limited English speaking participants. Um, our University of Washington Tic Tac is already open and available to work with communities and the Willamette Partnership will launch in the near future. And I've also linked the um, Tic Tacs on this slide as well. And now I'll turn it back over to Abby. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks again to Representative Strickland for inviting us today. We're happy to add, uh, answer any questions now, or again, the resources that we've discussed are linked in the materials that will be sent out shortly. So Sienna, I'm happy to give the mic right back to you. Thank you, Abby, and all of our EPA uh, presenters for that um, informative presentation. That was great. Um, I also, again, am going to remind um, attendees that now is the time to put questions in the Q&A box. Um, they can be questions for our EPA partners who just presented, our USDA rural development folks, um, or if you have quite, like overall general grant questions, you can direct those to our office. Um, since we've got kind of three folks, three moving parts with different expertise. So if you have any honestly grant related questions, just ask them and we can try and get them answered. Um, it's pretty great that we're all on the call. Um, right now to answer all of your grant questions. So I am going to start um, asking questions and then our presenters, um, please feel free to uh, provide an answer if you have one. And if not, we can troubleshoot, figure out what um, we can do otherwise. So this first question, um, the question is, I'm interested in the USDA Community Facilities Program for Thurston County. 
is the first step to connect with the loan coordinator? So the answer to that is yes. Um, the first step is to, you can contact me. Uh, you can contact the loan specialist uh, that was on the map um, and just reach out. Let them know what your project is, what you're looking at, see if it's eligible. You can um, talk further about any requirements, architectural, if you're building, uh, if you're purchasing, what is, you know, what does that look like for you? And if there is any availability or eligibility for any grant, we have very limited grant for that program and it's based on need, but you may be eligible. So reach out. You also can just go to our website, the um, Rural Development uh, Washington State website, and all the contact information is there. So, uh, and and also detailed fact sheets about each of our programs. So you can kind of get get a read on what's available. But we're happy to you know just talk with you over the phone or con uh, connect with you via email anytime. Thank you. And then for the attendee who ask that question we can see who's asking the question so i can make that connection um to marty and helen directly um to move that forward so thank you for that um this next question this is more of a general overall question so i'm curious if maybe folks from the epa and usda can weigh in um but this one is a common question that we get from our stakeholders often is how long does a typical grant application take to process? Um, so I guess from submission to um, announcing funding and what's the timeline on that typically? Well, I'll tell you, it depends <laughs> because some, some of our programs are ongoing and some of them have deadlines and cycles. Um, some of them are annual, some of them are quarterly. It really depends on the program. For water and waste, uh, our goal is 45 days. Um, it, however, when I say that, you know, you're really in charge. You're in charge of how quickly you process your application to get it ready for the loan specialist to begin looking at that as a full application. So, um, sometimes people look at that and they say, well, I started the application. How long does it take? to get to funding. Um, you know, we can assist you in the application process, but really it depends upon how quickly you want to move through that process um, and get us a full application. Once we have one, we're going to start working on it. Yeah, and on the EPA side, so we, we don't have loans. These are mostly grant programs. So typically what you will see is a notice of funding opportunity will be posted on grants.gov. Uh, we'll distribute that announcement via a press release or on our website. And a typical grant uh, will have an open application window, sometimes of, of as short as 60 days. And so really following the grant programs that you're interested in and making sure that uh, you've done some of that pre-work and thinking before the, the notice of funding opportunity is published is really important to make sure you have all of the connections and partnerships kind of started at least by the time you're starting to put your application together. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act program has a lot of grant programs that are new, and so you might see a different application window as those grant programs are stood up. Um, but but typically, you know, it's a pretty short turnaround time, and so it's best to be prepared. Uh, then applications will come into EPA, and they'll go through a threshold eligibility review to ensure that the applicant and the project is actually eligible funding given the, the grant program. And then it will pro proceed into a merit review process uh, where I, the grants are scored according to the scoring criteria listed in the notice of funding opportunity. That process can take several months, many months, uh, depending on the size of the grant program, depending on the number of applicants that we receive that make their way through threshold eligibility. Uh, and then what you'll often see is that EPA will announce uh, selections of grants. And so that will uh, notify 
those applicants that were successful in their grant application. And then it will take another several months for the, the actual award, the grant funds to be available to the, to the grantees uh, as they make their way through the official award process. Um, so sometimes, you, you know, I've worked for programs where maybe a notice of funding opportunity goes out early in the year, January, February timeline. And, you know, if we, if all the gears are, are running the right way and everything's a well-oiled machine, those awards might be made by the end of September that same year. So just to give you a, a sense of, of timeline and scale. Um, Derek might have, have more to add on this one. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add something unique about our community change grants. Um, so we anticipate that the notice of funding opportunity for the community change grants will be coming out later this year. Uh, probably in the uh, fall winter time frame. And a unique property of these grants is that it will have a uh, 12 month rolling review period. So there's not going to be a true deadline for them. Uh, we're just going to be doing rolling reviews. So it's something to keep note of because this is very out of the ordinary for pretty much every other EPA grant opportunity. Thank you. Um for that answer. And then Derek, your, your mention of rolling review made me think of this question that we get often in our office as well. And I noticed on the EPA slides, some of the um, funding opportunities had already closed. So if you are like, let's say I'm a stakeholder or somebody in the audience who like sees this opportunity, thinks that that could be really beneficial um, for the organization, but it's closed um, for this round of funding. What advice do you have for for folks that like see an already closed um, application and like what to do next. Well, the nice thing about the um, the programs that I alluded to is that we anticipate that they will be competed again sometime. We just don't know when that exact date is going to be. So I didn't really want to put anything in the presentation about that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, is to just stay connected with us on the listserv that I mentioned, they will uh, announce all funding opportunities um, as they come out in the Office of Environmental Justice, as well as I'm sure the Climate Justice Office or the Climate Change Office um, <laughs> has an excellent website that has a lot more information about, you know, the specifics about the grants, what partnerships are eligible, who is eligible, like the real nitty gritty about applying for these grants, as well as like I would also advocate um, reaching out to our Tic Tacs, they're funded to help you, you know, navigate this grant process. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an EPA grant either, though. So, um, you know, we recognize that, you know, trying to apply for these things is really difficult and pretty labor intensive. And so um, that's why we've kind of put together these resources in order to try to help as much as possible to get the funding to the communities that need them the most. Um, but yeah, no, staying in contact with us through our list service is probably the easiest way to stay on top of it. But then um, I would definitely utilize the Tic Tacs in order to make sure, like Kat said, that once these things get, you know, published and ready to go, that your coalitions are strong uh, in order to kind of like give yourselves the best possible opportunity to win these grant competitions. Thank you. Helen or Marty, did you have something to add about the close potentially closed um, applications well i think uh, as as was mentioned there's um some of these applications are closed because they're a fund the funder and so being in contact with our agency and getting on our email lists we can help alert uh you when when those larger uh partnerships are formed and you can then apply to those programs i'm going to put a link in the can, I think I can in the answers. Can I, let's see. Yeah, go for it. If it doesn't um, work, you can send it to me and then I can make okay. sure that it's in our like roundup email as yeah, well. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a, an email that goes out called Innovation Matters or uh, that has all of the funding applications and, and notices of things happening and you can just get it in your inbox. We also uh, have our congressional offices on a newsletter that we regularly send information out and I know those get passed along. We really appreciate that partnership. I think if you have an idea or you have a question, the best thing is just to contact us and we'll get you connected. 
As far as our regular funding, though, uh, housing, community facilities, water and waste, those application periods never close. They're always open. So we accept application every day of the year. Um, you know, if you want to work on your application at night and submit at one o'clock in the morning for a water project, good on you. Do it. So we'll be there the next morning to, to take a look at it, make sure it's all there and accept it. Um, so there is no, you know, no application deadline on those programs. All right, thank you. We are, are getting close to our, um, the end, um, of our presentation. So thank you. Um, I think we might be able to squeeze in one quick question. And this is just kind of, I know that like, I think I know where this answer is going. It sounds like we need, like folks should, um, continue to be in contact with our office and partners from the EPA and USDA. Um, but I'm just curious if like overall, if folks have any tips for first time applicants and if there's any common mistakes that folks can avoid. Um, we've got a couple more minutes to talk about that. If people just want to impart some wisdom before we finally wrap up. So the biggest tip I have for you would be to, you know, contact your loan specialist, get it out there, get your idea out there. You know, you may have a, a ton of ideas, not knowing which one to, to approach first. Um, you know, there are needs and oftentimes towns and cities have a lot of needs and they're trying to figure out which one to tackle first. The loan specialist can help with that. Um, and we can bring in our, our, funding partners with the state, with EPA, with RCO. Um, it's happened many times in just trying to figure out what's the next step. Uh, I wanna you know, throw out there, IACC is coming up uh, in Wenatchee. If you're not there, I know EPA has attended that. Um, it's an opportunity one time a year in Wenatchee and uh, the funding partners are there. There's, you know, all the towns and cities that want to be there. You have the opportunity to be there. There's classes. Uh, the funding is explained. Project programs are explained. Uh, the biggest mistake I see people make is that they wait until the last minute and they need money now, but they have decided to wait to contact somebody to say, hey, we actually need that money, right? Um, so get in early. Right now is a good time to be completing your applications with rural development so that they're ready to go when we get funding uh, in our new fiscal year. Uh, because we're gonna put, as soon as we get that money, we're putting it out. So um, there's no holding on to it. And we're, you know, we want to see those communities get what they need and get a good bid in early on when those contractors are hungry. So, um, you know, give us a call. I think from the EPA side, I know Kat, Derek, and I all have one thing. Uh, mine is if you are a first time grant applicant, use the, the Tic Tacs, use those service centers. That, that's exactly why they were formed and they will be able to do a, a scan and, and give you the assistance that you need. All right, Kat, what, what was yours? Yeah, so mine is don't wait until one in the morning to submit your application. Um, start your application process very early. There, once the notice of funding opportunity is published, don't wait until 11.59 on the date that it's due to start inputting that into grants.gov. And make sure that you've done all of the pre-work registering in SAM.gov. There are a number of steps to get into the system in order to submit your application successfully. And those take time. So get started really early. Make sure all of your registrations are up to date. And then submit your application with plenty of time to do any troubleshooting in case grants.gov has a glitch at the last minute. We don't want a good application to get stuck because of a technical issue. Uh, and I wanted to add, um... When you read the notice of funding opportunity, read it carefully. Um, if you look throughout the entire document, the scoring criteria for the grants are in there. And as grant reviewers, our job is to follow that scoring criteria to a T. And so 
uh, remember that um, as you're putting pen to paper. And then use the Tic Tacs, like Abby said, because um, the Tic Tacs also had to win an EPA grant in order to get the program. So um, even at the like basic level of technical assistance, they should be able to help you in terms of being able to get high scores um, related to the scoring criteria in the notice of funding opportunities. Thank you. That was some very helpful advice for um, applicants. So that wraps up our workshop. I want to thank everybody for your questions and um, for our um, friends at the EPA and USDA Rural Development for joining. Um, I also want to remind everybody that if you have any grant related questions and you are located in the 10th Congressional District, you are more than welcome to reach out to our office. Um, you can call the Congressman Strickland's district office at 360-459-8514. You can visit our website, you can send us an email. Um, another uh, resource or um, something that we can help you all with with grant applicants is we also issue letters of support um, on behalf of the congresswoman in our office. Um, and that can be helpful as well. So please don't hesitate to call, email, um, let us know and we can start, if we don't have the answer, we can certainly point you in the right direction. Um, and then also from our office standpoint, a great way to be up to date on grants that we think um, the 10th district be interested in is to subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do by visiting our website. Um, so yeah, I want to thank everybody for attending and that wraps up our workshop and we will send an email, we'll compile all of these resources that we shared today. Um, and then you can let us know if you have any questions following up. So thank you. Thanks so much for including us. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you.